Okay, and we are recording. No, we, oh, somebody in the waiting room. Sorry. That instant panic when you let somebody in and you're not exactly sure what's going to pop up. <laughs> Okay, David. Okay, cool. All right. Good evening and welcome, everybody. Tonight is the October 15th uh, Village of Woodbury Planning Board meeting. I am your chairperson, Christopher Gerber, and I welcome everybody to our virtual meeting. Um, I like that everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Hold on. I got a flag. I got a flag. There we go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States. The Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Everybody, please be seated and thank you. Okay. Has the board had a chance to read the September 16 minutes as submitted? Yes. Okay, can I get a motion to accept those minutes? I make, make that motion. We're going to make a motion. Oh. oh. <laughs> and right, you beat me. Bob and <laughs> Tommy D on the second. <laughs> Any questions okay. up there as presented? No. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All right. First item on the regular agenda this evening. Gluck Summit, Property, uh, Summit Properties ARB. Review application submitted for ARB review of five single family homes located on Summit Avenue in Central Valley. Said property is known in the Village of Woodbury tax maps as section 228, block 9, lots 1.22, 1.22, 4.21, 4.241, and 4.243. Uh, Who's here for the app? David, are you here for the applicant tonight? Anybody here for the Gluck Summit Properties ARB review? Okay. Could be a show up meeting. <laughs> going once, going twice. As they uh, say in the court system, when they have a docket and somebody doesn't show up, you take it on second call. Okay. So then you go to the next one and you'll you'll take them at the end of the agenda. Okay. Just one last time. David, you're muted. Oh, I don't know. Are you here for Gluck Summit Properties? So I know John's here for the shops. Okay. I tried. All right, moving on to the next item on the agenda, Shops of Woodbury, reviews, uh, review review site plan submitted for a mixed use development to include retail stores, restaurants, and a hotel. Said property is located at the intersection of Route 32 and Losey Lane and is known as the Village of Woodbury tax map section 225 block one, lots 34.1 and 34.2. Good evening, John, you're still muted. There you go. Uh, good good evening, uh, mem members of the planning board, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Kevin, Steve's not here, is he? No, I don't. I haven't seen him in yet. Okay, so Kevin is joining me uh, this evening. It's good to see you all. Thank you for your time. Um, we're back before you again. We made a submission, Kevin. I guess uh, a little over a month ago, responding to your comments uh, from your previous uh, round of review, and I, I believe we've addressed all of the comments. Uh, substantive comments at this point. There are a couple of technical issues such as uh, rim elevations and a few other things that uh, need to be resolved, but we're very anxious to, uh, to hear from the public because I, I took a look before we got on at the plan that we submitted to this board in February of last year. And in all fairness, if you compare that plan to the plan that's before you now, the layperson would have a, a tough time telling the difference between them. So I think the most constructive thing for this application uh, would be to get the public involved to hear what comments they have so that we can be responsive to those as well. I would quickly like to go through some of the issues that we have addressed since the last meeting that we were before you with. 
Um, specifically, we resolved the issue of the park and ride access with DOT, which was important, but a relatively small detail. We worked that out with them. Uh, we've added the second lane to the drive through at building one, uh, which again is an important issue, but we've resolved it. We've increased the width of the driveway aisle, uh, the main driveway aisle to 12.5 feet, so we don't require a variance. We've added some signs and stop lines and crosswalks as requested. We think that's a, a, an improvement to the site. Um, we've fixed the access aisles for the ADA spaces. Uh, one of the important issues that we have been discussing and we'd really like to put it to bed with you tonight because I don't think it's an issue at all, frankly, is parking. We have provided this board with uh, a shared parking analysis based on the code, based on industry standards. It's all very conservative. Uh, we'll still have more than enough parking even with this conservative analysis. Um, I would like to draw your attention to a memo that your consultant, your traffic consultant provided uh, to you last February, I believe, where he basically said that he agreed with the, the shared parking concept. Um, as you know, genuine proof, we offered the parking surveys from Woodbury Center from last year that were submitted for that property, which is directly across the street from us. It's very similar. It's a little bit larger, but it's got the same mix of retail, restaurant, and a hotel. It's parked at the code required parking of 1400 spaces plus or minus. So on a Saturday afternoon when we surveyed that, only 20% of their parking spaces were occupied. 80% of them were vacant. And when we did a projections to what it would be during the, high ho uh, the, the holiday season, the holiday shopping season, we determined that only 40% of their parking spaces would be uh, occupied. Kevin, I, can you share, is it pr permissible, Mr. Chairman, to share the screen? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Kevin, can you do that? So yes. you're ready there. I'd just like to show you, um, because a picture is a thousand words, the historical um, record of parking at the Woodbury Center, which is directly across the street. I think it needs to, it's disabled. I'm getting a message. Oh, sorry, hold on. You should be able to now, Kevin. Okay. Thank you so much. You got to be careful. You know, some people, they people jump and hop into these meetings and start sharing all sorts of interesting right. things. Yes. Yep. Okay. We want to go to the aerials, John? Yeah, please. Okay, so th this is um, aerial photography of uh, the Woodbury Center, which is directly across from us. You can see Losey Lane there. Very similar development, a little bit larger in size, but code required parking. This is from May of 2007. You can see lots of parking spaces, very little parking. This is uh, September of 2009. It's the same. The hotel is built. There's almost no parking there. This is June of 2010. It's the same story. Uh, you can just flick through them quickly. October 2011. What time of day were these taken? I have no idea. Honestly, I have no idea. Okay, well, I think that's pretty important. I mean, that could be when the employees are first going to work because I know I, I've been down there. No, I've, I've seen it a lot more crowded than that. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure it has been more crowded, but it never needs all of its parking. I mean, we've right, studied it. We've provided um, uh, the, the data from that. We've provided the data, this area, like there's 10, there's 10 shots. If it was, if it was crowded, we'd catch one of them that had significantly more parking. But let me, let me ask you a question. Uh, well, I have a couple of questions and I really don't want to cut you off in the middle of your presentation. I no, apologize. That's fine. That's fine. Um, and I apologize for that. Kevin, you see the, um, where the Dunkin' Donuts is, that shop you have in the bottom left? Uh, I'm pointing at my screen. Yeah, right there. Now, not that I frequent Dunkin' Donuts, but I happen to go there every now and again. And um, your, your project has a, has a few more of this type of quick, let's call it a quick service uh, restaurant uh, than Woodbury Center does. And I can tell you in the morning and sometimes on like a Saturday, Sunday morning, that parking lot is full. Like between the drive through and the parking, people walking in and out. Now, of course, COVID has definitely changed everybody's shopping habits, but prior to COVID, um, that lot is full. So um, I, while I get the comparison, I think it's a little bit of apples to oranges because of the, the mix of the project. Um, mm -hmm. I've only been in Woodbury about five years. I actually have never seen 
every store in Woodbury Center actually be occupied either. Every every time I go in there, there's also there's a vacancy. Um, right now, I think there's actually Models is out. Um, Century the the clothing store went out, and um, there was a, another retail store next to the Staples that recently went out. So you have three va- you have three empty stores in that building. Um, so while I appreciate and get what you're saying, I also think we do do need to represent that there are differences between your two between your two projects. Okay, no, I accept that. Um, what, what I will offer, I guess, as a counterpoint, is that we have provided a code required analysis yes. um, and, and an industry based analysis that show that we have more than enough parking. I'm confident, and all of the data that we've provided you on our project indicates that we have enough parking. Kevin, can you go to the site plan as well, please? Um, and we have provided, I think there was something like 15 or 17 spaces around that Dunkin' Donuts. We've provided more than 17 spaces around all of, of the facilities that we're proposing. So um, I, I'm confident that we have more than enough parking for each of the individual units and also in, in total. In fact, we're so confident that based on um, some comments we heard at the last planning board meeting, we took out 13 parking spaces and, and gave back 12,500 square foot of, of green space. There's a lot that's going to happen on this side. It's not going to all be built at once. And we would have the opportunity and you would have the opportunity if there were any changes in uses to any of the buildings or the sizes or when the hotel is built to review what our parking is in the future. And we would have to address any and all concerns that you may have at that time relating to parking or other, or, or other issues. And so, you, bring up, you bring up a very good point, John. Is there going to be an actual phasing plan here? Is the hotel coming first or is the brick and mortar coming first? My understanding, uh, and, and I, Aaron is on, the owner is on, and he can correct me if he's wrong. My understanding is that the retail will come first. That's correct. It's Aaron. So all of the, all of the pad sites are going to be built out first, and then the hotel will be built out? Well, so that, that's the intent. But if, if we start on the, on the retail and... Uh, and we get it, let's say we build the, below the driveway and to the right of the dotted line. Mm -hmm. And we get uh, interest from a hotel and we don't have interest for the other properties. You know, business says that you respond to the market demand. So we would have to file an application for uh, the hotel and we would have to modify and provide uh, uh, construction staging and phasing plans and modified SWIP plans to make sure that we continue to build and, and operate this facility in accordance with the applicable standards and codes. But John, uh, this is Rick, I apologize for the interruption, but just so it's clear, are you proposing a phased project right now or it's just you want an approval for the whole thing and you'll develop it as it becomes due and if you need to come back because of a specific tenant that you have, you come back at that point for the tenant, but it's not like a, a truly phased project, correct? The, the, the goal is to get approval for the entire site and to build it when we have tenants. Right. If I may jump in, it's Aaron, is that okay, if Mr. Trevor, yeah. jump in? Go right ahead, sir. Um, um, the, 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 the design in our, you know, the, the plan in our um, office is, um, so to get to get approval and to do the to put in the infrastructure for the entire property, you know, bring in the excavation um, drainage infrastructure for entire property, and start right away with the with the with the stores with the with the with this with the with the front part, mm -hmm. uh, which we are in deep deep talks. I mean, uh, with several end users, which are. All you, which, which are technically waiting for the to hear that we got the final approval and for the 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 the, 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 the leases are ready to sign, to be signed. So so I what I would envision is first definitely first jumping onto the store stores which are already waiting for we have some which are ready, which which we got LOIs three years ago already when we when we bought the property. So my vision would be that um, the hotel would be in a little later date, 
rather than the spores. Now, Rick, how, if we give preliminary approval to the site plan and an intensity changes in a, in a use, do they have to come? What's forcing them to come back here? Because they would, if they are only having approval for a certain intensity of use, they can't increase that. So if they have a tenant that would increase that intensity of use of what had been part of your approval, they need to come back for an amended approval. Okay. Um, and then, I'm and sorry, Mr. Jim, go ahead. On top of that, right? Excuse me? Each pad site would need approval on top of that then too, right? It, it depends upon what the final approval is. I mean, if, if they're asking to say that this pad site is going to have this type of intensity and this other pad site is going to have this type of intensity um, and the use is permissible, um, and they have enough parking for it based upon everything else, then they'd be able to build it. But if once they exceed those assumptions in the final approval, they would need to come back to ask for changes to that. Okay. So who reviews that, Rick? Is that Gary's job? Yeah, Gary would have to oversee that they are only allowed to have certain use intensities. And if they, it looks like they're getting beyond that, uh, he would, Issue, if they were proceeding that way, I think that they would come back because they know what the intensities of uses are. Mm -hmm. But if they don't, uh, Gary would issue a stop work order um, and force them to come back if they wanted to do something more than the intensity that's approved by this board. Now, I for Mr. Mr. Bassa, I'm I'm sorry if I'm saying your last name wrong. It's it's uh, I'm 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 not using my computer. It's Mr. A it's Aaron, Mr. Goldfink. Okay, Aaron. I'm sorry about that. You I can call me Aaron. All right, sorry about that. Sure. You know, being you guys are trying to get to the public hearing, and I understand that, and you are in negotiations with clients, are the uses that are on the plans now in line with the clients that you're looking at? Yes. Or are we just going to come back and do this all over again? No, no, no. Yeah, the answer is yes. And this, 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 this I'll give you one perfect example, um, uh, which, which is um, known in town that they're looking for a few years to come in in town, which is um, um, Starbucks. And I didn't sign any confidentiality agreement with them, so I can mention I can mention the name, um, which is um, can you, if when I'm using my my mouse, you can see it or right now? Yeah. This when I'm doing this. Yep. So so yes. Starbucks. I'm sorry. So so Starbucks Starbucks is uh, is calling me once a month. Um, Aaron, you said it's going to be approved. You think it's going to be approved? I said, a little patience. Start, start cooking the water. Um, so, so Starbucks is is either where we have right over here, um, yeah, um, where we have the drive-through. They are playing between this one over here and the one over here uh, uh, on top, right over here, with the second drive-through. But we know that Starbucks is going either over here, over here, and they are approved for both. Okay. Uh, and we do have an understanding. I remember when we had a meeting with um, uh, the building inspector, uh, um, I'm sorry, I forgot his name. Uh, Gary. Gary, uh, that if we do want to change any use or something that we'll have to come back to switch, if let's say it's retail and it's takeout or, or vice versa, anything, and it's, if, it's, if it's less parking, he said it's an easier thing. For example, right. um, one of the... One of the locations, what we're in talks, we actually had a site, site visit from them last week. And it's a, um, it's a national tenant um, for, uh, for doc doctor's offices. And um, they want to go right over here in the bottom. Um, what I think that's building two, Kevin, if I'm correct. This that's one correct. Over, yep, right here. Right over here. Um, um, and it's, it's with the parking, it works. So basically, the end, the end, the end user is always, you know, the customer is always right, you know. But but basically, what I'm telling them is, um, if you if you go over here or over here, we can we'll have to go and pull up a a a a, 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 a permit, and we'll have to do everything. But if you go in, let's say in building number six or building number eight, which is not intent. It could take you a few months later, so I would advise you to rather go building two, for example, rather than building eight. And most of the 
um, um, end users are, are picky and choosy, but they are calculating and pointing, which uh, we actually, we had one very um, impressive tenant, which uh, two months ago gave me, sent me a letter that they're backing out because it's taking too long. And I said, you know what? Um, I don't think you'll find a better site in Woodbury for this. And they were going, they were going to go right over here in center. That was very, a very prestigious um, organization. And I still hope they're going to come back. But that, that's also something which works well. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always r rather looking to get someone which needs and expects less parking spaces because that's always better. But I'm very much focusing. Um, and Dominic would be able to. I'm not sure if Dominic is on the phone or not. Would be able to clarify that that this is my focus to to minimize have to come back and screw off you know Chris your 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 head and and the board members you've spent so much hours and months and years on this so I'm, re I'm really trying my best but we might we might have to come back a little and niche over here and niche over there but I'm aware of it okay and, and, um Aaron if I may we expect from the public hearing to have some public input or comment that we will have to respond to we don't expect a lot but we don't want to advance this process and get down to cross every T and dot every I and then go to the public and have them make comments that are substantive and then we'll have to do it all over again and we'll waste your time and our time. So we feel that we're at the stage now where we would, this project, we and you would all benefit from public input on it. And then once we get to, through that process, we can get down to the very technical details and make sure that this plan, and it is a plan that you would approve that we would have to live with, uh, can work and, and can move forward. And if there's any changes to the locations or the uses or the sizes or the layout, significant changes to the layout, we would have to come back. We, we, we have to file with the building inspector to do everything. And right. he says, okay, it's in compliance with the plan. You Here's your permit and do all the paperwork. If it's not in compliance, he said, okay, you guys have to go back to the planning board because this is different than what you were approved for and we'd have to talk to you about what the implications would be. No, and That's correct. I, I get that. It's just, you know, we've, we've had projects in front of us before where, you know, we, we've approved the site plan and now they're back in front of us and they need additional parking and, you know, you can't make earth grow, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you can't, fact, me, you've only got so much land and I know one of the biggest concerns with Woodbury is ample park, traffic and parking, probably traffic then parking or parking, depending on who you talk to, but those are your two top, top things. Um, um, so I know, I know we're kicking her, I know we're talking about it a lot, but I think it's, it's a, it's a very crucial part of the entire uh, plan. Well, it's, it's important that you, your board feels comfortable that this plan will work from a parking perspective as well as everything else. I mean, my job is to, to demonstrate to you that we have enough parking and that it will work. And, and um, I, I am trying to provide all of the information that I can to be responsive to your questions. Right, no, I, and I we appreciate that. Um, Cause it's a late team, all right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if I can add one more thing. Yep, go ahead, Aaron. Um, from my side, I have lined up um, um, with uh, excavation infrastructure and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Basically, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here to come back uh, uh, in in a few months and say, okay, I've changed my mind. I would like to twist everything and start this game again. I mean, you can understand what yeah. we are paying over here every month for this for the last three years, and this, you know, I'm not looking to make it to drive well, you. I understand. Just Thank and you. you know, I'm sure you appreciate. You know, it's this board's job is to flush it all out and make sure we do our due diligence. One hundred percent. And that's all, that's all I think we're doing here is just flushing everything out and making sure we got it all out in the air so no one can say, you know, we didn't. 100 percent agree. Um, you know what? We kind of jumped around from our normal, uh, <laughs> our normal mode of operation here. So why don't I just? Why I know uh, John is hanging right. out, eagerly waiting to give us his, his report from H two M. Right? You did. There you go. Yeah, uh, eagerly, absolutely. Um, you guys received our memo. I, I'm certainly not going to go through every single comment in it. Um, it's rather lengthy. 
I will say that the majority of the comments in the in the in the memo and or in the main memo are carryover comments from from previous reviews. Um, and what Natalie did was provided a kind of a summary memo of the items that we think you guys should be more focused on now as as this project continues to move forward. Um, <clears throat> the first item, uh, the disposition of Melody and Losi Lane. Uh, the applicant is currently before the Board of Trustees for an agreement to uh, for the village to relinquish ownership of the portion of Melody Lane on the site. That obviously has to happen for this uh, project to, to go forward. Um, I'm not sure what the status of that is at this point, but I understand that uh, it is moving forward. Um, parking, I, that was discussed. They're looking for a waiver of approximately 19% of what would be required based on uh, code. We defer to your uh, traffic consultant as to uh, whether that seems okay. I, I believe he did weigh in with a, a, a memo saying that they were okay with it and, and also weighed in on the shared parking. Um, so the, 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 the only item I would point out here from our memo is they they talk about 13 land, land bank spaces that I believe are supposed to be the, to the southwest of building number eight. We just ask that they uh, to note those uh, because in the plans that we reviewed, it wasn't clear where those land bank spaces land bank spaces were. Um, still waiting for updated survey uh, from Mike and Tully to tie in the. Um, the, the previous survey that was done before all the DOT work was done so that we can verify <coughs> that the, the walls and the grading, especially at the property lines is uh, adequate. Um, water, the, this is an area that's served by the village of Harriman. Uh, they, they did provide a copy of an unexecuted agreement. So um, obviously, we, we defer to council for, for comment on that, but um, they, they clearly need to finalize their agreement with the, the village with respect to water, the village of Harriman, that is. Uh, with, with sewer, uh, there have been discussions, and I think there's been some verbal agreements on, on how they're going to enter in, into an agreement with the village for, for sewer service uh, with some kind of um, donation, if you will, to, to help with the village's current I&I &I problems to offset some of the um, flow that they expect to generate from the site. Um, loading berths. They, we believe they're going to need a variance. Uh, they, they are required to have three for the hotel per the code. Um, they're only showing one. And so we believe that's subject to a variance from the ZBA. And they also have some loading berths that aren't shown at the required size for the code. Um, we defer to council as to whether or not that is also subject to a variance. We believe it is. Um, that's their whole career. Believe, I, you know, that's, those are the, the points we really wanted to discuss or, or, or bring to light tonight. Um, at this point, I guess I would ask the board if they have any other questions about our memo. Um, not in particular, but my question I, is about the access, the emergency access road. If you look at that site and where it's drawn, there's a fire hydrant, like two or three stoplight poles, or John or, or C, I don't know who, where does that access road actually terminate on 32? 
Kevin, can you take that? I think so. You mean? You mean how far away from the from the poles from the well, power or the? Um... If you look at that side at thirty two, there's there's ever since they redid the configuration over there, right? There's, like, there's um traffic poles. There's a fire hydrant. There's uh a, like um coming down this hill. There's a, a spillway. Um, so I don't know if it's maybe possible either to maybe put two stakes in the ground. Oh, have someone put two stakes in the ground on thirty two to get a better idea of where this is coming out or add a little bit of reference to the drawing um, where it is. Because ESO is going to want to know where that terminates on 32. And I'm, I'm curious myself. Because sure. There's a lot of stuff that has to be moved depending on where it is. OK. Yeah, we can certainly get stakes out there to indicate where it is. But based on the information that we received, the as-built information, there's no conflict. Okay. So, um, but we can certainly I, identify I that in the field. Yeah, just because I, I'm sure if I'm having a hard time figuring out where it's coming out, there's probably another person that can't sure. quite visualize where it terminates out. And I want to make sure that works for them, too. I know we'll do turning radiuses and stuff like that, but, you know, when they see it, I want them to feel comfortable that that's a good pass for them to, to come in if they need to. Understood. Um, that's really that uh, question I had. So, Sandy, Rick, uh, oh, sorry, not Rick, Rob. Yes. Um, where, are the, ahead, where are the yeah? Where are the thirteen land bank uh, parking spaces? Sure. Exactly on that map. So, Ke Kevin, uh, what what we're proposing is that th this would be the parking layout, and if we ever have to go back and provide the land bank parking spaces, we could re reconfigure the spaces that are in the bottom left corner under C three one there. To, to look like they did in the previous um, submission. Kevin, can you, you don't happen to have the previous submission up there? Not, not handy enough, but it, it would, yeah, as John said, it would revert back to what we had previously proposed. So it would be in this area here. So you would have basically a road that goes along the dotted line there that would have parking next to it, which was in the, the previous submission. So those, those, are, those are the spots you gave back for the green space. Right. And we did that because we got more green space per space, and we thought that that was important. We could carve out 13 spaces some other way, but we wouldn't get as much green space. We thought that was important. Sorry, digging through my past maps. You guys, certainly a lot of paper. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. Any other questions, Rob? Yeah, out of the uh, total number of parking spaces provided, how many will be used by employees? It depends on the business. Um, as a general rule of thumb, employees are about 10% of, of many businesses. Some are a little leaner, some are, you know, restaurants have more, a few more. Um, stores sometimes have a few less. So we can't come up with an estimate. I could come up with an estimate, but it's baked, it's baked in the numbers that we use are, are based on the code and based on the ITE. Um, the code is a straight number that I presume includes employees, but doesn't specifically say, say it. The ITE is based on surveys of other uh, shopping centers. So they go in and count how many park, cars are parked in the shopping center, and they count the number of thousands of square feet, but they don't count the number of employees. The shared parking manual produced by the Urban Land Institute has data on how many are employees and how many are, um, how many are either shoppers or diners or guests at the hotel. We could break that out, but basically all we'd be doing is breaking down from the top number and saying of, of the 461, let's say 46 are employees and the rest are customers. We'd be happy to do that if that's something you'd like, Robert. I'd like that. Okay, sure. Hey, I'll try. Good, Chris. Tommy? I'm good right now. Thank you. And I'm just going in order how people show up on my screen. Sandy? Um, I just have a couple questions. What what prevents shoppers from parking in the commuter parking lot? Yeah, I know that's a big Well, uh, it, it's a it's a, a couple of things. One you can have signage and enforcement. But frankly, it's self-enforcing because the commuter parking lot is going to fill up in the morning and the shoppers are going to arrive when the parking lot is full. 
plus they're going to park in the spaces that are closest to the store so they can they they won't want to because the spaces in the commuter lot are further away and they won't be able to because the spaces will already be occupied by commuters well i guess i'm, I'm thinking more on on weekends and holidays well on weekends and holidays number one we've indicated that we have enough parking Number two, the parking that we're providing is closer to the stores uh, than, the, uh, than the commuter parking. Um, number three, I'm not saying it's never ever gonna happen because you're always gonna find somebody like me who decides I'm gonna do this, right? Number four, if it is an issue, you have enforcement authority. So uh, we, I don't think it's, it's an issue that would warrant putting up a fence and a gate to keep the two separate, to be honest with you. No, I just don't want to see commuters, you know, that are on off hours or whatever, not be able to park there because, you know, shoppers are taking those spaces. So yeah, I, no, I don't think it's going to happen. Okay. All right. And then as far as the loading berths, Rick, you had said that there's no, no way to waive that. So either that definitely requires a variance or they they come up with the greater number of loading berths, correct? That's correct. As John said, right now, because they don't show enough, um, they would need a variance. They could then modify the plan to show it. Um, they'd probably have to lose some parking, I think. Um, but um, that's what they would have to do. They, it's their choice to go which, one way or the other. So is that something, again, I know they're anxious to get to a public hearing, but is that something that's recommended to to wait for until after the public hearing, or is that something that should be done as soon as possible? It, it's, it's really how the board likes to look at public hearings. If you're asking for my opinion as to how boards ought to look at public hearings, it's that you should bring the project to a certain level of um, specificity and finalization but it's a little bit foolish to require it to be brought to complete finalization because the whole purpose of the public hearing is to get input to possibly impact how the plan looks. And in this respect, I agree with John. Um, I think that the plan as it is presented now is the type of specificity and detail uh, that allows the public to have informed comments um, and um, the, the issue of the, the birth to me is a very small issue. They'll either go ahead and, and put it in or they request a variance, but that's not really a, a, a public input issue. Um, the public input is, you know, where are we going to park, how are we going to park, how the entrance is, where these things are situated. Um, those are very important things from the public as to how they view it that may impact your decision making. Uh, both as the location of the buildings and location of the parking vis-a-vis -vis the buildings and the access roads, et cetera. But whether or not they have three or four parking berths is not really a, it, it's not a public issue so much as it is just a code issue um, because it says it's, you need four and they've only provided three. But, but what about no, the, other, the other code issue that you talked about that may need a variance, the 12 and a half or 12.5 and they're only proposing 12.3. Yeah, did, did I hear, John, that you're, you're now changing that to the 12.5? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so they won't need a variance. That, okay. I, I did not look at their most recent plans to, uh, when I added that provision in my memo to you. Can we just um, add, can I just add a little bit of background on the, on the births? Because we've had a lot of discussions about that, and I think it's important for some clarification here. Um, two points. The, the, Loading bursts that are shown on the plan now that were slightly smaller in length than they're supposed to, that's not a problem. We can resolve that. Specific to the hotel, we have a solution to this um, that will enable us to, to provide all three of the required berths. Our position is that they're not required for this type of hotel use. Independent of that, we recognize that it's an ordinance issue and it would require a variance for that type of relief. We can provide them without changing the plan. So concern about whether the public would see something different later as it relates to um, the births 
um, that's that won't be an issue. The plan will look the same. We can provide it by adding docks into the rear of Building Nine. Then. Yeah, where would those docks go? Correct. Where where you see it now. So there's a basement level in in this building. Um, that's why, in fact, the the my previous testimony and also before the zoning board, we talked about how the building is five stories, but we've shown this as five as six floors because there's it was always intended to be a service floor, basement level, and so we can provide them backing in to this space. There's more than enough room to fit three side by side. Uh, and just, just to to go to Rick's point and to Kevin's point. Um, Really, what we think, what I think is the most important thing here is that we put in a plan that works, that's appropriate. We may have to get a variance, we may have to put in three docks, but if you think about the, what the code is requiring and what we're doing, the code requires a certain number of, um, of loading spaces per number of rooms. And as you go up, you require more, uh, if you have more rooms, you require more loading spaces. But that's for a standard hotel, and when the code was written, standard hotels often have um, banquet facilities and they have restaurants and they have various other amenities that attract more people. This hotel basically, it will have a kitchen that serves yogurt and milk and coffee and nothing else. It's not gonna have a restaurant, it's not gonna have a banquet facility. So the only trucks that are gonna come here are the linen trucks, and uh, the breakfast delivery trucks. And so we believe that we only need one loading bay. And we're gonna work it out one way or the other. We'll either get a variance or we'll show three loading bays. And, and that's the type of issue that actually, um, when zoning was uh, determined to be constitutional, was that it needed to have a zoning board of appeals to vary it because of this very issue. The, the Supreme Court said, listen, these zoning district regulations are broad and they apply generally across the district or to a particular use in various districts. And it may be unique as to one person or another that you couldn't anticipate in the initial zoning. So you are able to go and get variances. This is, would be an area variance type um, because it would be dimensional. And um, the, the reason that they could argue it when you go through the test is for the very reasons that they're saying it, that it may be appropriate to have a variance, but they also may choose a, a swifter route of just putting it in. Yes, thank you. So, a couple quick comments, Rich, and then we're gonna get to you. Uh, Avriel, I see you had posted some stuff in the chat. We're not at, a, we're actually not at a public hearing right now. Um, so the public will have a chance to speak and ask their questions during that uh, time period. It would just be out of order for us to start answering questions uh, for one particular person when we're not in a public hearing. Um, so with the loading bursts in the rear, you're maneuvering and, you know, I always look at worst case scenario, the maneuvering plan doesn't show a 52 foot truck being able to fit back there. Are you saying you'd be able to put the three loading bursts back there and get a full not saying it would ever happen, but some, listen, I had UPS freight show at my house one day with an 18 wheeler to, to drop something off because that's a truck they threw it on that day. Um, would a 52 foot trailer fit back there? Well, well, in all fairness, the loading docks are not designed, your code does not specify that you have to have loading docks for 50 foot, 53 foot tractor trailers, number one. And number two, um, while anything is possible, the majority, the vast majority of trucks that are going to be coming to this hotel will be box trucks bringing, and even if they have the, the food trucks, they're the little short Cisco ones, the, the semis. Okay. I'll trust you. I, I'll have to look at the spot on the code. Not that I don't believe you, but. No, no, good, please. I, I don't have, unfortunately, there's only so much I can have memorized in my head at one yep. time. Um, I think there's a bigger, uh, with, with trying to go to, and again, we, we can do it. It's up to the board. The Melody and Losey Lane uh, application for the trustees. Now, we have no influence. We don't know where they are in that process. We don't know when or if or how they're going to vote on that process. From Unless I'm wrong, this project kind of hinges on that happening. 
If that doesn't happen, there's, there, there's going to be an issue with the project. If I move to a public hearing, this board moves to a public hearing. Now, Rick, keep me honest here. My shot clock starts okay. because I, I've moved to a public hearing. I've said the, you know, the, the plan has been submitted and, and ready. And, you know, they only need some tweaks. So if the board drags their feet for whatever reason, holidays coming up, stuff like that, I also don't want to be forced into a default approval either because my clock runs out. No, it, all right. First of all, I will never let you fall into a default approval. So what happens is um, that if you are up against that shot clock, uh, what typically happens is I then, before we get there, I will ask the applicant to grant an extension of that time, which you're allowed to do by consent under the state law. Um, and if they fail to do it, you have to make your decision before then. And if the plan isn't ready to be approved, then the plan gets denied. So I've never had a situation where the applicant has refused to grant the extension because it re otherwise it will result in a denial for them. I'm and you've been very good with that. I just I wanted to bring it up, you know, because it it, it everything's in the realm of possibilities when I look at stuff sometimes. Just so, my own knowledge, what is that period of time from public approval? How how long of a period of time is that? They are looking to merge, right? But is there a subdivision in here? I, I, I have to look back on this. There is a lot merger and right. I didn't recall a subdivision. I don't know if there's a subdivision in here. I know there's the no, it's a it's a lot consolidation that they need to do. We haven't seen that plan yet, but it, it has been requested. Right. And it but, is necessary. Okay, there, there's no default approval then, Chris. Okay. The default approvals are only for subdivisions, subdivision. not for site plans and not for mergers. Okay. Very good. Rich? Uh, yeah, I have one question. Is Cabela's a potential retail outlet? Aaron, you still there? Uh, uh, you're talking if Cabela's is a potential retail outlet for this property? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm reading H2M letter dated October 16th. And uh, is it still planned or is that off the table? No, that's, that's, that's no. The answer is no. So, so they're not a potential vendor. That's correct. Is there somebody in place of Cabela's? A, I mean, Cabela's was going to be a 90,000 square foot store, I, I believe. Correct. And we have, we, uh, we, we, the biggest store we have is 11,000 square feet. So it's not going to be Cabela's or anything that would strike you as being like Cabela's. Okay. Just checking. Okay. But hey, to, be, to be fair to, to be fair to everyone, um, they don't have um, tenants locked down yet. Right. And they, they're in discussions with some, um, but um, things like this are always fluid. So, you know, if in six months Cabela's come in and wants to have a, a 15,000 square foot store and that makes sense for the applicant and they'll either be able to move in if that makes sense on the current plan or if not, they'd have to come back for an, uh, a modified plan. So I, I, I just don't want, I think the intention in the answer is that there's no present agreement um, or concern to have Cabela's there, but whether it's Cabela's or somebody else, I don't want it to be taken that they said no at this point, but that meant no, never. I'm not sure that it should be taken as no, never. That's correct, Rick. Okay. And Rick, I just had one other question about the water agreement. Um, has, or well, maybe it's for John, I don't know. Has, has the applicant approached the village with this agreement and it's just not been signed? I mean, what's the discussion with the water agreement? I can answer that question. Hello, Steve. Hello, I finally got here. Uh, yes, we have been in com communications with the uh, village board. The village board, by resolution, approved the concept and the agreement. The only thing we have, we're waiting for right now is uh, an attachment to the to finalize the agreement is the water plans. Uh, they and the village of Harriman has the right under the agreement to review and approve those. 
as does your board and the health department. Uh, we're finalizing the review with Lank and Tully, their consulting engineers. Uh, we had a couple minor comments we received the end of last week. We hope to get those back to them this week. And once we get, once they sign off on the plans, we can finalize, we can execute the contract at that point. Steve, what the um, form of the agreement that I saw uh, did not have in the body of the agreement um, the gallonage that was at issue. It said that it was going to be in Schedule A or something like that, and that wasn't attached. It wasn't attached yet. So we worked with their consultants, WSP, uh, their hydrogeologists. Ge uh, we came up with the, the uh, uh, water usage, which is basically the same number that we presented to this board uh, for sewer. Uh, and I believe, just not exactly, but it's around 41,000 gallons a day. And that's the that number we've been using. Sandy? Yeah, I, I just, I, these agreements I haven't really been, you know, I'm not familiar with. So are they, do they uh, have to be renewed? Are they subject to anything? Is what if, if the water usage was greater or what if they, the village of Harriman ran out of water or, or was low on water? How, how does that impact a project like this or any well, project that they agree to provide water to? Well, I, I think what would happen is that um, there would not be any type of condition that would uh, be specific where all of a sudden they could just say, uh, we're not going to provide if, if this happens. Um, mm -hmm. But they certainly have the ability, both with respect to outside users, um, such as uh, shops at Woodbury would be, as well as their own residents, that if for some reason there's a water shortage, mm -hmm. they have the authority to go ahead and, and uh, meter out water as they deem fit in the overall best interest and it's going to be their residents first outside users always get the short end of the stick so they there may be uh, restrictions placed upon that if it's based upon not just you know, willy-nilly but if it's because there's not enough water mm -hmm. then there'll be restrictions and the uh, shops at Woodbury that's a risk that they take that that would happen and they would have to live with the restrictions okay I, I just wanted to know if there was anything that you know if if the village of Harriman could not provide water is somehow the village of Woodbury. Are they tied to this? Do they have, do the, does the village of Woodbury have to act as a backup and provide no. water? Is there any health code or anything like that that says no. that? Okay. Not at all. Okay. Um, the monument sign, do you guys have a mock-up of that? No, we do not. I think our response to signage in general is that at this point that the, any signage will comply with the code uh, and that will be subject to a building permit uh, uh, and review by the by the building department. All right, let me rephrase. Are we looking to put a monument sign in the front of this facility like it's across the street? Yes, there's a one. Sh it's this, the location is shown on plan. Okay, we're going to, I know I would like to and I'm sure the public would like to see a rendering of that prior to the public hearing, please. Because is it going to be the same? Like every store in the in the in the development is going to have their name on it. Are they all going to be the same size? Is the hotel going to have the top marquee in ninety-seven font, and everybody else is going to be forty-two font under it? Um, I, I can't. I don't think signs cause us some some growing pain sometimes. So I think a mock-up of what it would look like would be helpful uh, entering into a public hearing. Rick, uh, Rick, do you have anything else? No, I'm good. Okay, John, you're, you're good, right? Okay. Yep, all good. Any, mem any, other mem any members of the village board have any other questions? for the applicants or the consultants on this application? No. no. Um, Mr. Chairperson, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, the question is as follows. Um, the reason why we didn't provide a, a sign is because um, usually the larger tenant would, would get more recognition than a smaller tenant and since let me take an example, building number eight, which is right now over here, um, is 11,000 uh, 11, square feet. L let me take an example. If 
a, t a tenant um, wants to occupy the entire space, they are clearly going to ask for larger recognition on the signage than building number seven, which is only 2,000, because they are like uh, more than five times as, as a, you know, in size as a tenant. So I have no issue at all to, to design anything and, and, and to, to make sure that it works with the, with the village. But I'll, I'll be a little the client that uh, nervous to, to do a, a design, which I'm going to say, okay, this is going to be the design because I don't know if building number eight is going to be split in half, for example. You, you see what I'm getting? Uh, I, I see where you're going, but the sign code is also very specific around those types of things about size, square footage, colors, shape, all that fun stuff. So given the rigidity of our sign code, I also think it would probably be pretty easy to come up with a mock-up uh, that would fit there. So I, Mr. Chairman, yep. um, you know, I, I think we could come up with a generic mock-up for the public hearing that would show the area volume to be occupied by the sign. Yeah. Uh, it would show boxes where names might go. And the concept is to show the public where the sign's going to be, how big it's going to be, and give them an idea of what it might look like. But, you know, as, as Aaron said, to get into specifics about how big this sign is going to be, who's going to be on top is almost impossible. But we would like to, you know, to move this along. So we'd be happy to put, to put in some sort of a uh, generic sign to show you the size, the width, the height, and okay. maybe a couple of panels. I think that would be, I think that would be more than adequate. Super. And I, think, Thank you. I think we could also discuss color palette because I know that in the, in the past that's always been a concern of the board as well. So, yeah. And Go I, ahead, Rick. I have to uh, check it out. My recollection is is that uh, this cannot be something simply put off for uh, Gary to decide. Right. I think that when it's done in connection with a site plan, that the planning board actually has to approve the signs. Um, so it can't simply be a condition of. That's my recollection. I'm going to look into the code, but my recollection is that you can't just put a condition on saying, well, they'll have signage in accordance with the town code, that there's more to it than that, including the ARB portion of it. Right. Right. And that's, I think that's what went up, what happened across the street at Woodbury Center. It was part of the original resolution of approval there. Right. But what Steve is saying is that it didn't have to be, but I have to check that because I thought it did. Well, we'll comply with whatever the regulations are, obviously, because we have to. Right. No, I, that's my recollection, but I can't say for certain, and I will check it out. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. All right. Any other questions for this applicant or the consultants? Um, I have just a, a couple of things. Just with respect to Losey Lane, um, the applicant still has to provide more information and an escrow to uh, the Board of Trustees before that happens. Is meeting tomorrow night. I don't think it's going to be getting in for then. So I don't know exactly when it's going to happen. But you're right, Chris, that uh, Losey Lane is a critical part of the way this project is presently designed. Um, and so uh, it's certainly right now the project is contingent on it because it's it includes it. Um, if they weren't going to be including it, uh, we'd have to figure out what changes would have to be made but that hasn't yet been determined. But that is something, again, that I don't, what would happen is that you have a public hearing and you're assuming that they're gonna get Losey Lane. And if in fact that didn't happen and then the project changed tremendously, uh, you have a right to go ahead and have a new public hearing on a, a radically changed plan. So I don't think it's a reason to hold up this one. If in fact it doesn't occur and there's a big change in the plans, you'd get another public hearing. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to raise, um, everything else is my memo to you and have been addressed by the others or can be postponed for decision-making, um, is the ARB. Now, is that something that's going to be coming in with what you want to be approved in this application for site plan now, or is that going to be completely deferred until some other time? And the reason that I'm asking it is that ARB requires a public hearing. So typically, if you're going to be uh, asking for ARB approval together with um, your site plan, 
is that we put it in the same public hearing in order to avoid having two public hearings. Um, but that's my question to you. Are you planning on having an ARB review and approval as part of your final resolution of approval for the site plan, or you would come back later for that? I'm talking to the applicant and their consultants. Jeopardy theme plays. <laughs> I, I think you know the not having the end users, which is one of the one of the issues that we deal with in a development like this, is that um, you know we we think that the ultimately as the, as these come online, you know you're going to that end user is going to come back to this board, you know for a specific site plan if there's a change in the loading dock or the dumpster location, uh, and e ARB because that that's the, they're going to have their their color palettes, their signage, you know, those things that are, are specific to, to that user. Uh, so you go, I understand that, you know, somebody comes in and they may want something different. So they could come in for an amended ARB. <clears throat> are you coming in and saying, this is what the building's going to look like and have the board approve it so it can be built? No. <clears throat> You're not. not? Not at this time, because it, it, it would be all speculative. Uh, we'd be wasting our time and your time. Uh, so, so, so the board is basically just approving pads. We're looking to prove, yes, we've always said these are, we're looking to prove pads. Uh, you know, architectural review could be, you know, the color palette for signage, uh, landscaping, retaining walls, you know, those, those site features that we're proposing that will be implemented in the development of the site. And building elevations, Steve. You know, but not building elevations. Yeah, we're not, no, those would be specific to the end user. Right. But Rick, how do we work ridge preservation into that? And consistency across the site. Well, those are two different questions, so I'll take them one at a time. Uh, with respect to ridge preservation, that's going to be problematic for this site. Um, first, we should have some kind of um, overlay or outline of this plan as to what part of the site is subject to ridge preservation, because I think it's only a, a small part of the site, but right. I don't know that. But we need to do that. And when you look at the code for ridge preservation, all the assumptions are absent here. Right. right. So it and all of those provisions are subject to you know to the greatest extent practicable or as possible. I think the end result for ridge preservation is that you're not going to be able to do anything other than potentially with some colors of the buildings and roof. Like, I, th I think that you would be able to insist upon um, the brick, whatever the... Earth tones and that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, you, you would be able to impose that in, in that section, but the remainder of it just wouldn't practically work. You're never going to be able to go ahead and, you know, have this blend into the hillside just by the fact of the way that the DOT, among others, um, have reconfigure this site. Yeah. So I, I think you'll have very little of ridge preservation uh, to alter it, although it, there will be some with respect to the materials of whatever buildings are in that section. And that's why I, I guess I'm asking the uh, applicant for the next submission for you to identify on there um, the portion of the site that is above elevation 600 so that we would know what is what portion of this site is subject to ridge preservation review? Okay, we can we'll do that. And Chris, um, your question was, how do we uh, determine consistency if they're coming in piecemeal, right? Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, um, the way that first of all, you have to decide whether or not you want that kind of consistency because there's some places that don't want it and some places that do. So it's that's also something you have to wrestle with. Assuming that you want some sort of consistency in style, that you don't want this eclectic um, design of, of buildings in there, um, then the applicant is the one that's going to be at a disadvantage because the first one to come in will sort of set the tone. If you're going to want to have consistency and then that will set the stage for consistency. And I think the applicant already knows that and appreciates that difficulty uh, with respect to 
the first in as far as ARB as to what it's going to look like will set the tone somewhat for um, the site. So if they have an, if they had a Google coming in with this all glass structure, um, it's unlikely that you would uh, want a log building uh, demo place right next to it um, with these uh, rustic uh, log looking buildings. So that's up to the applicant. It's in a risk of the applicant, but you're right. If you want some consistency, which is your preference and you have a right to do that, um, the first one coming in for ARB kind of sets the tone. Okay. Uh, and obviously the, the applicant knowing that can work with that particular um, tenant to try to figure out and work with them to have something that can be consistent in a way that's not going to be restrictive toward the other tenants coming in. Okay. Thank you for that, Rick. And <clears throat> appreciate that. All right. Any other questions, comments, concerns for the applicant or for the consultants? All right. Uh, what is it? No, November 4th is our next meeting, right? Mm -hmm. I'm on too many committees. And I, I can't keep, keep my group. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm pretty sure it is, Chris. Um, we need, that's enough time to notice, right? If we do a public hearing then, Rick? Yes. yes sir. All right, I will offer a motion to hold a public hearing for this application on November 4th. I'll make that. Or I'll just, make, wait, did you just make the motion? I'm sorry. I need, motion. I need a second for somebody. So I seconded it. And this, by, just, just to make sure it's very clear, this is just for the site plan. It's not with respect to any ARB. You right. Right. Yeah. I see some head nodding. Do I need to amend yes. my motion? Okay. It's just site plan, so that's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, any questions from the board on the, on the motion? Are we going to have a mock-up of the signage yes. prior to that? Yes. Okay. You can, you can get that done, John, or Kevin, or whoever's yep. lap that's going to pull yes. in. Okay. Yep. Um, I heard Steve's really good with Crayolas and some markers. <laughs> <laughs> I try to stay in the lines. <laughs> all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Okay. We'll see you guys back on the 4th. Thank you Great. so Thank much. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye. Chris. Chris? Yep. I would like to thank you. Today is my birthday. That's a nice birthday present. <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Happy birthday, Aaron. Thank you to the board. And to Rick. So I guess you can, uh, before we go to local law number 11, Chris, you can ask to see if, or reach out to see if uh, Summit Properties is around. Any special legal term when you go back to the bullpen? No, you say I'm going to return to the docket. Okay. So uh, going back People to the versus Gluck Summit Properties. Anybody here for Gluck Summit Properties? I there's a gentleman David, but there's no other. I'm confused. Let me just send him a message. I'd really. David, can you hear, David Mortimer, can you hear us? Can you unmute yourself? You need to unmute. Okay, there. There we Hello. go. Are you here for, I are nothing you here to for do. clock? I, I, I am not. Okay. You're not, okay, thank you. I, I, I would have, I, I would have raised my hand earlier, but just, uh, no. Just want to make it's sure. Very, just, I was oh. uh, interested in the last uh, presentation. Okay. Very interested. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, once, twice, one last call for Gluck Summit Properties ARB. I'm going to presume they're a no-show then. All right. Um, next item on the agenda, Local Law 11. Uh, review, uh, review referral by the Village Board of Trustees 
uh, of Local Law 11 entitled A Local Law Amending Chapter 310 Zoning of the Code of the Village of Woodbury to Remove Bed and Breakfast and Boarding Houses as Permitted Uses Within the Village. Chris, I know you have a lot to say about the removal of boarding houses. <laughs> um, are we leaving the term boarding house in the code? I know we, there was a line that said we're leaving um, the other one, bed and breakfast in the code. So we know, it, are we leaving boarding house, the definition in the code? Let me just say what we did here. I don't see that we're doing that. So I think that that could be something that you would, um, would recommend to the board, the board of trustees. Right, I think it'd be best just to still define what a boarding house is. Some of us had to look it up. Yeah, so, but it, what you can say is that uh, it's being taken out of the uh, off street parking, um, but um, with respect to, um, the definitions we could say that it's uh, prohibited rather okay. than taking it out. Okay. And Just then it'll be up to, I mean, that could be your recommendation and then the board of trustees could decide to say that or they could decide just to take it out completely. So, uh, but your recommendation is that there should be something that it should stay in and say that it's prohibited, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Got it. And that means the definition of a boarding house stays there too. So there's no ambiguity of what a boarding house would be considered. Correct. Okay. Um, John, I think H2M, you guys had a little memo on this one, right? Yeah, yeah. there it is. You're muted. Still muted. Hold on. I'm mute, John. Sorry about that. I thought I was unmuted. Um, yeah, we, we didn't really have much on this. Um, I, I guess the one item in our, our, uh, brief memo to point out is there were a couple applications before you within the past, um, few years. And <clears throat> it doesn't appear that there's any grandfather clauses, uh, within this, re this proposed repeal. So that's something you might just want to mention in any recommendation make to the board of trustees. Ooh, ooh, I know an answer to that one. It becomes a pre-existing non-conforming condition so that it would be allowed to stay, right, Rick? If it exists now, but I think what John is talking about is that you have some pending applications. Okay. Those pending applications, um, as, as John is noting, um, would not be able to get an approval if this passed prior to the time that they would have gotten approval and did some work to become vested. Um, and sometimes uh, there are grandfathers um, clauses in, I don't really like that uh, word, but where they allow certain applications to proceed, but normally it's if they're like close to an approval, um, which your, as I understand it, there are two before you now, neither one, as I, I recall, is close to an approval. Um, no. And so um, it's not usual for a board to, uh, you know, a legislative board like the Board of Trustees to go ahead and prohibit something, decide to prohibit something, but then let applications that are in their nascent stage or certainly not near the very end um, continue. Usually they only allow things to continue if, if it's a gross unfairness because they're about to get an approval next week and, and you go ahead and you make it illegal this week. Um, I don't think either one of those applications that we have sitting in front of us right now are anywhere near that stage. I think it's been over six months, probably since either one of them has come back before this board or submitted any new information. So I am of the thought that we do not put any sort of grandfathering uh, in or in, in a recommendation that grandfathering be allowed. Yeah, and I, just as a follow up to that, I'm sorry, Sandy. Um, just as a follow up to that, the your comprehensive plan went ahead and said that it's an you need to work on that definition, say, of bed and breakfast. Um, and you know yourself that 
wrestling with that, especially the owner occupied it has been a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was one of the reasons that the board of trustees decided rather than trying to rework that whole thing to get it is like, do we even want bed and breakfasts? You know, is that really what we want as part of Woodbury? You know, are we trying to be a little Vermont or, you know, some outpost? Or are we fine with um, the hotel accommodations that, that exist or will exist um, and don't need bed and breakfasts and the problems uh, in some instances that it, that it brings, such as, you know, absentee landlords, Airbnbs that are unregulated, um, that, you know, you, they, the, the board, as you know, when they went through the hotel regulations, even got rid of motels. So, it, you know, they sort of decided what type of transient housing that they wanted. Um, and I think they've decided, and that's why it says in the purpose provision of this local law, that they're reprior, reprioritizing um, the uh, transient uh, accommodations that are in the village. Rick, I just, oh, go ahead. when you said grandfathering, I know that's, I, I want to make sure that the two or three that are existing, that this this change doesn't affect those, correct? Only one, like, one of department, there's only one legal b and in Woodbury. So the one on up by Dr. Spitalis, did that expire? I guess so. I checked with Maria and Gary uh, late last week, and they said the only approval for a and b is Rushmore. Okay, because there was one up on Jill Jill Road, I think that was Dr. Svitala's old property, but it wasn't. I know it wasn't being operated as such, so I guess that expires then if it's a special permit. That um, it depends upon the particulars of the special permit, but not. It usually isn't automatic. Um, now, once it's prohibited, everyone that is active as a B and B would be able to continue. Okay. Um, but there is a, but it continues as the category, as I'm sure you're all familiar with, a pre existing non conforming use. And the law basically says they're not favored, they're allowed because otherwise you'd be taking away some constitutional property rights that they had. So that's why it's con allowed to continue. But they're not favored. So almost every jurisdiction, and certainly Woodbury has this, that if you have a pre existing non conforming use, and there is a lapse of a year in using it for that, you then lose that favored status and now nobody can uh, have that use in that location any longer. Okay, so that's probably what happened to the other one. Um, no, because it's B&Bs are still allowed. So that's only if it's a pre-existing non-conforming use. Well, that's, I mean, if, if Gary, if the building department isn't, isn't considering the other one a bed and breakfast anymore, I'm assuming it must have expired. I don't know. I, I, it's, you know okay. it's, it's hard it's, to say. Gary might have taken Chris's question is that how many B&Bs are there is how many B&Bs are operating okay. in the village. I, I don't know exactly how Chris phrased it and how Gary heard it. Okay. And I, I didn't lawyerize, lawyer, lawyerize it. <laughs> My only other question is, um, should we, should we ask that? And I know it's just semantics, but uh, Airbnb, because a lot of people don't look at Airbnb as the same as a B&B. They think an Airbnb is just a room. Yeah, and Airbnb doesn't have to be a and b but certainly many B&Bs turn into Airbnbs. Um, but so I assume they're trying to, the, the village board is wants to encompass Airbnb in this as well. No, they, they, they're not trying to do that at all because oh. um, Airbnbs are not permitted in the village now, so they don't have to make a provision for it. Gary has interpreted the code as it's not provided for in the code and therefore it's prohibited. And so oh. there's no Airbnbs that are permitted in the village. Okay. So it doesn't have to be specifically excluded because it's not provided for. Correct. Okay. Got it. That's it for me. I mean, they, they could come out and say, this is also prohibited. Um, but right now, I don't, I don't see a real need for it because the interpretation by Gary that controls is that Airbnbs are not permitted under the zoning code. Okay. I just thought there were quite a few trying to be trying to operate in Woodbury. So I thought that that 
there are some that have been operating and Gary, to my knowledge, has, um, when he finds out about it, follows up on it uh, to tell them that it's illegal. Okay. That's it. Rick, I have a question. Um, are there any boarding houses in operation now in uh, Woodbury or has there been? Not to my knowledge. Okay. And what if someone rents out a room? What would that fall under? Could that be a disguise for a bed and, bed and breakfast? Um, well, it wouldn't be a bed and breakfast if they just rent out a room. Um, it would be closer to a boarding house um, because bed and breakfasts have certain requirements and it also has to be something that's approved by the planning board. Um, whether or not you could rent out a room, I'd have to ask Gary whether there's any circumstances. Typically not because that's what an Airbnb is, is you're renting out a room. So I'm assuming that it's not uh, permitted, but I don't know. You'd have to ask Gary uh, for an interpretation whether or not somebody could rent out a singular room. Should that be included in the, uh, the new law that we're proposing? Well, it certainly doesn't need to be included if it's not allowed. If Gary's interpretation of saying Airbnb isn't, is that renting out your uh, room in your house is not permitted, then that encompasses that. I just don't know what that is. So you can ask Gary, and if you think, if Gary says that a renting out a room is all right and you don't want that to happen, you can, even outside of the planning board, you can just ask the board of trustees because um, they'll have to have a public hearing on this um, to say you shouldn't allow rentals in any any house. Okay, thank you. Rich, any questions? Or no, I'm good. Okay. Tommy D? No. All right, so it looks like we have the one recommendation to the board to leave the definition of boarding house. And, but note that it's prohibited, right? Note that it's prohibited, yeah. Um, anything else? Everybody else otherwise is good with the law as written? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yep, I'm good. Cool. All right. And then that's all we got to do on that, right? right? Right, Rick? That's correct. I'll write up a letter to the Board of Trustees on your behalf indicating that this is your one recommendation. Okay. Thank you, Rick. All right. Last but not least, Central Valley Property Management. John, do you want to? I know this came from you guys, right? Yeah, um, I see uh, Mr. Cassess is on the, the call, so um, he can weigh in as well. But this has been kicked around for a couple of months now. There, there were some, uh, some grading issues um around the building and we believe they've um come up with a plan now that adequately addresses those um using a combination of uh small retaining walls uh handrails and um beyond that there was there was a submission today uh, about the type of rail that they'd like to use i think Previously, the, the board had approved a uh, uh, horizontal rail configuration. Is that right, Jerry? Yes, that's correct. We found out today that when Gary looked at the code requirement, that the four horizontal rail would only work as a handrail, but not a guardrail. And since we have the elevation change, it's required to be a guardrail. And the code for a guardrail requires that the space between any horizontal or vertical member needs to be less than four inches or four inches or, or less. Um, so that type of railing would have to change to either a multiple line horizontal rail, which gets very busy, or in most cases, they just go to a four inch on center half by half baluster. And we've done this, uh, actually it's a picture in uh, the town of Warkill a new building we built up there. And that is, uh, my understanding, a code compliant guardrail. So instead of having four horizontal rails as we originally reviewed and approved, um, 
we have to obviously meet the code. So that's why we're suggesting that new design. Yeah, and 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 the reality is, I mean, the the horizontal rail, uh, which the board previously approved, um, you may find more attractive, but uh, for for this site, since they are going to have to provide this vertical member rail, if you will, um, to us it makes sense to to keep it consistent throughout the site, not have two different types of uh, rails, if you will, uh, one on the back and one on the front. Um, so I believe the the building inspector is on board with this. We, we certainly have no issue with the, the type of uh, railing that they're proposing. Um, we One thing we would just point out is they did provide a rendering that uh, of the front of the building and we believe that the the railing is going to have to be extended along the front of the building further than the rendering is showing but uh that's that will be determined in the field based on the the final grades but um uh in general we we agree with uh what they're proposing at this point and if i may when we did go for the approval, uh, everybody seemed to realize that it would, had to be a field decision. And in our final approval, item number 10, it indicated that, that your board gave Gary Thomasberger and Dennis Lindsay approval to review that on site and make any recommendation. And we agreed to adhere to their recommendations. The reason why I guess we're here tonight is because it, we're adding some retaining wall instead of just all railing and steep slopes. So that's essentially where we're back here as a field change other than a directive from the previous approval, which would right. be able to decide the location and the extent of the railings. Hey, I think it's the retaining wall that is what really got kicked back. Um, yeah, this would be on the Estrada, starting on the Estrada side where that staircase is and then terminating along 32? That is correct. Now, would it be a continuous height all the way across, or is it would, it would it terminate into grade on both sides? You're correct in that second statement. So what it is is that at the staircase, we need to retain the earth, so it'll be probably 42 inches tall to be even with the top of the sidewalk. It will come out towards the intersection and that'll be on both sides of that staircase. A shorter section of wall will turn up um, Estrada Road, and that would reduce down to a, what they have there is um, a 24 inch high wall, 20 inch exposure is what um, the final termination would be on the Estrada. And the same thing goes for along 32, as the grade allows, we have to maintain a two on one slope. And I believe they said for every two foot out, it drops no more than one foot. So as the existing sidewalk along Route 32 becomes more even with the higher sidewalk that we added to have the ADA um, circulation, if you will, around the building, uh, that wall becomes, um, I guess, less in height until it is stopped somewhere. I think it's almost midway to the building. It shows on a plan where they feel that it will terminate where there is no longer any hazard of any slope being more than two on one. Now, so that's most part, it's going to be 18 inches, I guess, exposed or 20 inches exposed. But that section by the staircase will be almost four feet. It level is three, three foot six. That is correct. Level with it almost. That is correct. It'd be three foot six tall. Yes, sir. So there are Plant, I think there are plantings there. And I know you guys started planting the site. So, yes, are those so there's, there are trees that, I'm sorry, go ahead. Are those plantings then now going to move up to be three feet in the air? Like, because I presume it's really going to be one big planting bed at this point. It'll be um, a lower section and a higher section. So when you're closer to the intersection, we have more of a plant bed. Um, and that would be where the trees, there are trees along the front 
of uh, the building. Those are on site, but being staged right now and maintained until we're ready to build the retaining wall and then plant those trees. Those trees uh, would be um, somewhat elevated now. Yes, and you know above that uh, 20 inch wall. So that'll become, like you said, a larger planting bed up high. When you get to Estrada or the intersection, we have more real estate between that retaining wall and the sidewalks that are there. And there's one cherry tree, I think it is, or their white pear trees, whatever they're called for. That one at the intersection would not be on top of the retaining wall, but in front of it down low, because we have enough room to plant it. Okay, and that, I don't, I don't have your original site plans in front of me. Was that, was that tree always planned to be there? Yes, I it just, was, but it, it needs to be shifted closer to 32 because of the retaining wall now. Okay. And John, and I guess there's no problem with sight lines being the planting beds a little higher up and we are in a corner there? Yes, the, that's correct. Okay. Solar question. Sandy? Again, just, oh, wait. Did we lose Sandy? Looks oh, like she, she dropped out. You had enough and took her window and went home. <laughs> uh, Tommy, you got any questions for these applicants? No, I'm all right on this one. Rob? He's muted. I'm all right. <laughs> Hold on, I got to find my, I got to let Sandy back in. There we go. Rich, you have any questions? No, I'm good. Hold on. <laughs> Sorry, just waiting for Sandy to come back in. We can see you, we can't hear you. Well, now try. Now, still can't hear you. I guess I jinxed her when I asked her if she had power for this meeting. <laughs> no, my computer just, I just got this whole big error. And it just <laughs> I, as soon as I called your name, you disappeared. I was like, you didn't have to run away. <laughs> no, I just, but I, I, I was trying to get onto my phone again. Um, so am I, is it my turn to talk? It's your turn to talk. <laughs> okay. Um, Jerry, this this color of this um, now I'm messed up the the Bedford Brown. Do you? We got I or at least I got black and whites. Do you have that color? Um, for the uh, retaining wall block. Yeah. Yeah, actually, we do have a physical sample on site that we showed. Um, Dennis and Gary, and um, it w it's a submittal that we put in as well, which is like a it's uh, out of a man, um, out of a brochure, so it's not exact, but it essentially is uh, tans and browns and a little grays, so it uh, blends in with the brick of the building. Is why they. It does blend in. I mean, in my mind, I'm I'm thinking that that brick color and brown. Uh, I don't know, but. Yeah, it's not really. You know, I guess that's what they're calling it. But if you looked at it, it was it's kind of uh, tan and and a little gray in there as well. You know, something like that. Oh, did my screen not share? No. Uh, there it is. Oh, there you go. Yep. So, something like that? Yeah, so it's more like where you have your, it's more where you have your uh, mouse. It's called, it's saying. Um, for tumbled? Is that tumbled? Yeah, it says retaining walls, and I can't oh. see what that is. It's this, okay, my mouse is working. It's, it's kind of like this one. Tumbled. 
um, Sandy. It's not the bed. That isn't where the mouse is. The mouse is on the right hand side. So I'm able to move mine. I don't know if you could see it. No. Okay. Is it the tan brown retaining wall block? Yes. The one on the upper right. Oh, okay. Um, that that looks a little more gray than what we have on site, so I, I can't say that for a fact. The one we have on site is more of a brown color. So more of like this color in here. Yes. I get I, it's important because uh, we've actually heard a lot of nice um, compliments about your building. Uh, so very people have been very happy with the way it looks. So we want to keep that momentum moving forward. And we do as well. We don't want to make it look, we don't want to make a mistake now. And then what color is the railing? Railings to be painted black. It's going to be black. Okay. Yep. And then I know I had asked about the, the uh, measuring for, uh, and it could be just an optical illusion, but those steps are all to code? Yes. They're seven inches high, 11 inches tread, pro, you know, projection. One inch uh, uh, yeah, cam Sandy, the Sandy, we, we went out and measured them. They, they do meet code. Okay. All right, that was my question. All right. Uh, so, Rick, do we need a motion to change? It's just for the, um, to allow the retaining wall, right? Not the railing, or do we need to do both? I would suggest, I mean, you're, there's sort of a package deal. Um, and you, you have to be a little bit careful here. The reason that it's being brought to you and the manner it's being brought to you is, is a, a well-worn procedure that has been done over decades with this planning board. And that's, um, when um, it's being built in the field and usually it involves uh, H2M and the, it looks like it's deviating somewhat from the plans. If it's very minor, then it's a field change that never comes back to you. Let's say that they moved a curb um, an inch and a half uh, from where it was supposed to be on the plans. And H2M in inspecting that says, or Gary says, that doesn't pose a problem otherwise, and it's just an inch and a half different than what it said in the plans. And that's normally, that kind of thing would be approved as a field change in the field without ever coming back to you. Um, there are some others where it's a little bit more than that, but it, does, it doesn't seem to warrant going through an amended site plan with public hearing and everything else. And those are the ones that come back to you that you authorize as a field change um, because H2M doesn't feel it's quite within the, the minimal things that they would typically give a field change on. So what you would be voting on is that the um, modifications to the handrail and uh, the adding of the retaining wall uh, is acceptable as a field change. Does the board feel we have enough information to make that determination? Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. Andy, you good? Yeah. You sound reluctant. Are you sure? Excuse me? Are you, you sure? You sounded, that was like a reluctant, yeah. I, I am reluctant, but I'm, I'm not going to hold them up anymore. I want to see this project get done. I think we're all in the same, we're all in the same boat there. Uh, there are, there were a couple of things I just want to make sure it's ah! no, there are. It was in the letter, so I just want to make sure. So I know the fence in the back. Yeah, and there's also they added some more planting where we have pavers currently between the sidewalk and the rear parking lot. There's um, I think there were box hedges or something, boxwood. Uh, just want to make sure that that plan that he submitted with those changes, and there's a railing added to the back of the building as well. That's where that slope is in the brick. That, steep that is slope. correct. Yep. Yep. So it's on the, it's on there. I just want to make sure that, you know, we, we see everything that's on that plan that's considered to be the, the field change and that's all encompassed. 
And how is boxwood with the deer? I have no clue. I, I'm, I have, that's what they that, suggested. So to me, that's important because again, I walk that every day and there are deer all over the place now. And they're, uh, I know I've had a certain type of boxwood before that it attracted the deer. And I really don't want to see any more deer out by 32 <clears throat> than. Yeah, I wish Steve was still on the line. Um, he's the one that recommended it. Um, he's a landscape architect. I would assume that he would take that into consideration, but I, I, I don't have that information. Whatever he wanted me to plant, that I would plant. That's According the only to, comment that I would have. I, I would like it to, whatever it is. I think he wants to like create like a hedge there so people don't walk through right. it. Right. You know, so whatever that should be, if it's not box boxwood or, you know, According to the Google, it is a broadleaf evergreen for a deer resistant garden. Deer seem to shun the attractive glossy green foliage because of its strong scent. Okay. According I to the Google, why you said yeah. that. <laughs> okay. I have them all around my house. They don't bother them whatsoever. No, I, just didn't know. I know there's yeah. different types of boxwood. That's why that's, uh, that was my only question on that. Mm -hmm. um, I can go ahead and you can modify your resolution or motion, I should say, um, that all this uh, are field changes with the condition that if the, that the landscaping must remain in a vibrant condition or be replaced. What he said. I believe that's on the plans anyway. <laughs> you got that, Claudia, what Rick said? <laughs> um, I got it. <laughs> Thanks, okay. Claudia. Thank you. So are we sure? Are we sure now, Jerry? I feel like we're, like once a month you just you're lonely and you want to come back to us. That's true. I am, but uh, <laughs> what's the, what is the inside of the building? I mean, how close are you there? We are, are done inside. The inside is okay. So no yeah. more changes. The commissioning on the, the elevator. The commissioning the elevator. I think on Friday. So that's okay. it. Um, I mean, one small ask while you're hearing you, you're talking to us about the building. The the bank next door to yours is, is yours also, right? Uh, well, let's be clear. I'm sorry. I'm just a construction. I'm just a contractor. I don't own the property. All right. Because I was going to say, can we do something about those two lights in the front of the building? <laughs> what uh, What two lights? I'm sorry. Uh, on the, that I can on the, do. The, Anything with the construction I can do. So what is the, the issue? Those, those two lights on the bank, those, those bright, um, they're on the front of the building. You have such wall packs. Okay. Wall packs. You have such nice lighting on the build, the new building. And then you have these, this beautiful, the bank with these two just bright lights. Okay. I'm just, maybe if you happen to have a spare light hanging around, you could. Well, that building will be renovated. That building was to be renovated, obviously, for the new tenants. And when we, when we get them in there, um, they decided to, they're, we're actually waiting for the permit to be issued for that. Um, which I think we had to get the plan signed, I believe, is the reason why the permit was not issued yet. But we could change those to the same matching type of lights. So that's not an issue. I figured I'd ask why you were here. Yeah. So um, everything else except for the, the fence that you talked about, the, uh, the white fence? Yes. So that's on the, in the letter, but that's separate, I guess? That's not a field change or...? No, what I was, what I thought the motion was, was uh, to approve everything in your letter. What's the date of your letter? Do you have that? I don't have it in front of me. Danny, you have, I don't, I have everything. October but 1st. Thank, Thank you. you. This, that one? The, uh, it was, oh. That one is October 1st. No, it was a letter from, um, oh from H2M that indicated, uh, you know, why we were coming back. Hold on. I'm checking my email. Yeah, but the, the submittal, Jerry, that, that you made that talked about the fence was dated October 1st. Okay, so the submittal shows you what the fence looks like. Okay. Yeah. Agreed. Yes, that's a submittal. It was basically submitted to H2M for review and approval. So yes, yeah, so if that gets, if that's what the, the board has now, that's fine. And the fence is, is just along the, uh, that back property line, right? Between the, that blue house and the, your back parking lot. 
it actually goes all the way down. There's a private road behind us. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the name of that road, but essentially um, the entire back property line and it follows that in a Z-shaped fashion. It, it uh, separates down at the bottom past the snow staging area. There's a, a section of fence that goes almost to the guys. There's a garage on that side, uh, that private road. It starts from there and it delineates the, back, the property line as it comes across the back of the property. Then towards 32 along the back of the blue house and then between our parking lot and the blue house. And it stops about, uh, I think it was 18 feet shy of a strata. And I think the reason why that was stopped shy of that was uh, just for sight distance of them pulling in or out of their parking, uh, their driveway. So it's about 400 feet of fence. Uh, the only thing I ask, and I don't know, Rick, if we can do this, just like we do with um, bushes in perpetuity, can we add that a fence be maintained in perpetuity? Yes. Okay. So it's much easier on that one because it's vinyl as well. The other one was a cedar fence that would have been stained on a regular basis. And it would, but that cedar fence, the coloring of that cedar fence was what? Uh, you know what? That would have been a question to find out that it wasn't on the ARB. I would assume it would have been maybe a clear sealant or would it be stained? Okay. It would be somebody's preference. I, I thought guess. it was, I, if I recall properly, I thought that the discussion was that it was supposed to be like more of a natural, unobtrusive fencing for the, the houses that were there. That's why I'm just not real keen on this white vinyl. I think if you look at it from a maintenance standpoint, I think a, a vinyl fence probably makes more sense than a cedar. Uh, you know, yeah, over time, a lot better. Or, yeah, I think it's a lot easier to get someone to replace a missing eight foot section or a damaged eight foot section of vinyl fence and go out there every two years and stain a cedar, a cedar fence. And I know, but I think we were trying to keep it. I mean, because of the, the comments of the people that live there, that's why I thought we were trying to keep it more of a natural, you know, natural looking type of fence rather than, than that stark white vinyl. But that's just my opinion. I think oh, is a lot of it's covered with planting though, right? Uh, it's hard to say, right? Yeah, it depends where you are. You know, there's a lot of trees back there, but, um, you know, there's going to be some section of it actually from our parking lot that's visible because it's uh, between our site and the blue house. Right. The other stuff down at the bottom, you can't see at all from our section. Um, but it gives them privacy in their backyards, in their backyards, really, more so than to keep the view out of ours. I, I, I think it's their side yards, actually, but. I hear what you're uh, saying. It's along their side yard, but it continues for the whole depth of the property. Mm -hmm. So it gives them privacy in their backyard. You know, if you stand on top of the hill now, well, because it was a, um, there was a, um, I guess, you know, a, a regular metal fence, a cyclone fence, or what do you want to call it? Um, at the bottom there, you could see right through, it was a four foot high fence. So now this will be six foot high and it gives them some, you know, privacy or what have you, but. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. That's me. And like I said, for maintenance reasons, I like the vinyl better than uh, an actual wood fence. And for us, we're not having to maintain it as, you know, I think it'd be more durable. Do we have any other questions, concerns, or anything else we want to flush out? That's it for me. Okay. Everybody else is good? Yeah. Yes. If I could uh, restate the motion so it's clear in the record for that Claudia may take down. And um, I would think that the motion that would be in order given all the discussion is a motion to approve one, a handrail in front with the addition of a low retaining wall, two, a railing in back, three, fencing, 
and four landscape changes per the October 1st, 2020 submittal as field changes with the condition that the fence be kept in good repair and maintained in good condition in perpetuity and the landscaping must remain in a vibrant condition or be replaced. Yes. Everybody okay with that motion? Yes, yes sir. I'll, uh, I'll make that, I'll make the motion as Rick as stated by Attorney Golden. Any seconds? I'll second it. Second by Tommy D. Any questions? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And Claudia, if you didn't get it all, if you just send me an email, I'll, I'll uh, cut and paste what I just typed. No problem. I will okay. be some new email. <laughs> okay. And then we'll meet with, uh, I guess, Gary and Dennis's office because John had said that they want to extend the fence more, or the, the railing more than shown in the plan, but that'll be as their discretion in the field, correct? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So next time we see is ribbon cutting, right? I hope so. <laughs> Any? <laughs> I, I'm so, I just you gotta gotta have some fun with it sometimes. Any other business before the board tonight? I think we've gotten it through our agenda. All right. Motion to close. Make that motion. Tommy and Rich. Anybody want to stay? I didn't. Think so. All in favor? Aye. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Have a good night. Good night.